come to the stage, Corey. Thank you all very much. It's a genuine pleasure to be here uh, and particularly to have sat through that very moving opening ceremony. It's the second of those I've seen since I arrived here and they get better. They're, it's it's lovely. I wish I could uh, speak Maori to you. I can't, but I can say that the mana tikanga I have experienced since arriving is really lives up to the reputation. You have a fantastic place and I've had a wonderful time here. So like many of you, like most of you, I earn my living on the internet. And it, even if you're not earning your living on the internet today, chances are you will be tomorrow because everything we do today involves the internet at a minimum. And it seems very likely that everything we do tomorrow is going to require it. Now the wonderful thing about being in the creative arts is that there are so many ways to do it. If you look closely at the careers of everyone who's succeeded in the creative domain, you find that no two of them are precisely alike. We group them together as pop musicians or science fiction novelists, but really it's quite fractal when you get, when you get down to it, and no one's really self-similar to anyone else except at 30,000 feet. So virtually every artist is a creative one-off, and that is the terrible thing about earning a living in the, in the arts, is that there's no clear path to follow in order to figure out how to make your living as a creative person. Uh, practically everyone who's ever set out to earn a living from the arts not only failed to earn a living from the arts, they lost money doing it. If you were to divide everyone who ever bought a guitar with the ambition of making money uh, by all the people who ever did so, you would find a number that was as close to zero as makes no difference. Now, living, earning a creative living is something of a Six Sigma event. I, I like to think of it as um, having a kind of firing line of people flipping coins, and many of them get heads and many of them get tails, about 50-50. But every now and again, someone will get their coin to land on edge. Um, people who get their coins to land on edge, they, they may have got their coin to land on edge because they've cultivated some small skill at, at coin edge landing. But chances are that luck and wind had more to do with it than anything else. Um, now, uh, that uh, line of people tossing coins, hoping to get one to land on edge, I think analogizes neatly to the creative arts. You, you can uh, improve your chances of earning a living by being good at it, but I've known many artists who are very good at it, who never earned a living. Now that doesn't mean that people don't try, people buy lottery tickets too, and there is one important difference between flipping a coin and earning a living in the creative arts, which is that art is something that's deep and innate to our condition. Babies start to sing before they know anything else. Um, people who have been horribly traumatized, we help them recuperate through art therapy. Uh, arts are innate to the human condition. And moreover, artists who do make it are often treated with uh, reverence. And so it's a very uh, attractive activity for people to take on. And perhaps that explains part of why the arts are a non-market activity. That the, the reason that so many people set out to earn a living in the arts, even when the odds are so long, they're setting out to win that edge on coin, coin co uh, contest, even though they know that beyond practice and trying a lot, really, it's mostly down to luck. Now, when we talk about the internet and the arts, we tend to focus on which business metal models serve artists best. But I think that that's got it backwards. There are so many people pursuing the arts at any given moment that if there is even the tiniest, most obscure business model, some artist somewhere will be making art that's suited to it. And really, when we uh, look back on the artists who've succeeded, we're engaging in a kind of hindsight bias because the artists that we look at who've succeeded didn't succeed because our policymakers wisely chose the right business model. They succeeded because they happened to be making the right art at the right time in the right place to succeed given the technological and cultural factors in place when they were around. And heaps more artists went away bitterly disappointed. Now, trying to preserve business models is just a way of saying that last year's lottery winners should, get on, should go on winning the lottery forever. And that is a nice deal for the lottery winners. And I am a lottery winner. I earn a very good, comfortable, middle-class living in the arts, which makes me not a one percenter, but a 0.01 percenter in the arts economy. So I'm not entirely opposed to the proposition of preserving last year's lottery winners in perpetuity, but it's the kind of a cure that can be worse than the disease. Uh, 
because the business models that work for the arts in relation to technology, they reflect wider social questions. Our technology, our economy, our politics, our tastes. And when you freeze old business models, you do so at the expense of everyone who would succeed under the new ones that are waiting to emerge. And you also go to war against those technological, those economic, those political, and those social factors that are changing which business models work. Now, speaking as the kind of artist who did find a niche in the business models of the past two decades and is hoping to find a niche in the next couple of decades worth of business models, I'm here to, suge to suggest that our priorities should not be defending business models. It should be to ensure that whichever business model is working at any given moment, our policy framework is such that it keeps as much of the money as possible in the pockets of the creators who are making the most successful work, and secondarily in those who invest in their works, and then finally in those who distribute their works. And to that end, I want to propose three laws. Originally, I had one. My uh, agent it used to be Arthur C. Clarke's agent. Now he represents the estate. He told me that I couldn't have one law. I had to have three. I have three laws to keep money flowing the right way, things that we can choose as creators, as politicians, as regulators, as technologists, uh, that uh, artists and that audiences and businesses can act upon that puts the money in the pockets of the people who are most directly responsible for making the art that we love and that moves us. So the first law goes like this. Anytime someone puts a law on something that belongs to you and won't give you the key, or, or rather, anytime someone puts a lock on something that belongs to you and won't, give you the, and won't give you the key, they have not put that lock there for your benefit. So if you're a creative person and you upload a digital work to one of the major platforms, Steam or Apple or Amazon or what have you, there's a little tick box that says, protect your work from piracy, tick here. And when you tick that, um, you uh, end up putting what's called digital rights management on the work. It's uh, something that's supposed to stop the work from being copied without your permission. Now, in practice, it's actually not very good at this for reasons that are well understood by cryptographers, uh, except for those cryptographers who work for digital rights management companies who insist that everyone else is wrong. It's a bit like climate science in that regard. Um, the way that, that cryptography normally works is you have two people who want to keep a secret and an adversary who wants to listen in on them. Alice and Bob and Carol is how we usually put it. Alice and Bob are on the same side. Carol is nefarious and wants to tamper with or eavesdrop on the messages. And Alice and Bob, they make this assumption that Carol knows that the message exists and that Carol can get a copy of the message. And they assume that because they're using networks that Carol might be able to intercept. Maybe they're using Wi-Fi and Carol's in the room and so she can see the packets flying through the air. Maybe they're using a satellite, and so Carol is somewhere in a continent-sized footprint. Maybe they're using uh, the public internet, and Carol works for the phone company. Or maybe they're using the internet, and Carol works for one of the Five Eyes spying agencies. And so they assume that Carol knows that the message exists and that she can get a copy of it. And they also assume that Carol knows how they scrambled it. Uh, the reason that they don't keep that a secret is because we have exactly one way to evaluate whether security exists, and that's to tell everyone else what you think you've invented and have them point out your stupid mistakes. Uh, it's the same way we do all knowledge creation, right? Before we had science, we had alchemy. It was a lot like science, except you never told anyone what you learned. That's why for 500 years, alchemists discovered in the hardest way possible that you really shouldn't drink mercury. The only act of uh, transformation the alchemists ever managed was to convert the base metal of superstition to the precious metal of science by means of publication, telling people what you think you know and letting them point out your dumb mistakes, not just the people you like, but the people who really dislike you and would like to embarrass and humiliate you. And if even they can't find the flaw in your reasoning, then it's probably pretty sound. So Carol and Bob assume, or Alice and Bob assume Carol has the, a copy of the message and she knows how they scrambled it, which leads to this puzzle. How, do Carol, uh, how is Carol kept out of that message? And the answer is that modern cryptographic algorithms use a key. The key is a very small piece of information without which the algorithm can't turn the scrambled text into the unscrambled text. And if they can keep that key secret from Carol, then she could turn every hydrogen atom in the universe into a computer and ask it to do nothing until the end of the universe but try and guess what the key would be. And we would run out of universe long before we ran out of possible keys. And that is how we keep Carol out of our messages. 
That's how regular crypto works. It's not how voodoo crypto works in the DRM world. In the DRM world, there's just Alice and Bob. Bob is Netflix. Alice is everyone in the world who might have a Netflix account. Bob scrambles the Netflix movie and sends it to Alice and then gives Alice some software that has the key to decrypt it because no one would be a Netflix customer if they couldn't decrypt Netflix movies. No one wants to pay $11 a month to watch a scrambled movie. Uh, and so um, they give her the key and they hide it uh, in a piece of equipment that they then provide her with and they allow her to take away to anywhere she wants and subject to any analysis she wants. And then they expect that she will never find the key. And the technical term for this in security circles is wishful thinking. Right? Even really good safes are kept in bank vaults, not in the bank robber's living room. We don't hide secrets and equipment we give to our adversaries because it's not a good way to keep them secret. And so practically speaking, DRM is built over the course of years at the cost of millions by skilled engineers and it's broken by teenagers in an afternoon with hobbyist equipment. Not because the engineers are, are dumb, but because they're doing something foolish. They're, they're doing something impossible. As, as we say in many of these technology debates, wanting it badly is not enough just because it would be awfully convenient if you could hide secrets in keys you gave to your adversary. It doesn't mean that hiding keys in equipment you give to your adversaries will ever work. So um, it's illegal to break digital locks. It's illegal to break DRM. And that is the first line of defense against DRM. If you are a signatory to uh, the um, WIPO copyright treaties, which New Zealand is, you've had to enact laws to uh, make it a crime to break digital locks. If you, are, uh, if you have entered into any kind of free trade agreement with the US, those laws have been strengthened, uh, which New Zealand has, Australia has, Canada, where I'm from. We have had to uh, strengthen that, that uh, WIPO basic level of protection to a very high level of protection. Now that doesn't actually stop pirates, right? Pirates are already breaking the law. The fact that they have to break the law some more to commit an act of piracy is of no bother to them. But it does stop all kinds of other legitimate activity, like if you're a publisher or an author and you have a dispute with a platform that's put its DRM on your work and you wanna authorize your customers to break the DRM and come with you to a rival platform, the law prevents you doing that. And this gives the whip hand to the platforms over the um, rights holders and the proprietors of those rights, the investors in those works. And we see that play out in the world in all kinds of ways. Achette, the giant French publisher, which is like many of the giant publishers, a division of an arms dealer who you would expect had read Art of War or, or at least have some tactical nous. Um, they had insisted all along that every work that was sold that they held the copyright to should have DRM. And um, I think they thought that they were really putting one over on big tech when they said that this would have to happen. And then what happened is they hit a dispute with Amazon and they said to Amazon, we want to be able to renegotiate our deal so we get a bigger piece of the pie and have more control over the sale of our goods. And Amazon said, no. And by the way, everything you've ever sold through our platform, millions of dollars of eBooks, it's all locked to our platform and we're not gonna unlock it, so go ahead. Pull your works off our platform. See if people are willing to uh, maintain two separate incompatible libraries in order to follow you to one of our also ran rivals. And a year later, Hachette capitulated. Random House capitulated immediately afterwards without even putting up a fight after an initial uh, press release that said that they would do something. Something turned out to be giving Amazon everything that they wanted. Um, you see this play out in uh, other marketplaces. If you've ever, um, if you're an app vendor, if you've made apps, you'll know that when Apple launched the App Store, they had this deal where they would take 30% of the purchase price and you would get 70% and then 100% of the revenue generated from your app. So if you sold the Kindle app on, Am on Apple's platform, you'd get to keep 100% of the revenue from the books, but you'd have to give up 30% of the revenue from the app. Once Apple became the dominant platform, they changed the deal. Now they get 30% of all the revenue generated by apps in perpetuity. It's an enormous land grab, and it's the kind of thing that you would naturally expect any firm that enjoyed market dominance and lock-in to engage in. I, I, it's hard to imagine why their shareholders would tolerate any other kind of activity. So um, this has become a kind of motif of the internet, that platforms grow up, they lock the works of their supply chain and their proprietary wrappers, 
which the supply chain is led to believe will protect their interests. And then once the platform gets big enough, they start to squeeze their supply chain and they use that proprietary lock-in. And that takes dollars out of the pockets of people who invest in creative works and puts it in the pockets of people whose contribution to those works is formatting a text file and collecting a payment for it. And so if you want to ensure that the bulk of the revenue goes to the creator, it has to come from the investor, right? The investors are the people who take the money from the platforms and hand it to the creators. And so you have to make their share of it bigger. And the most immediate way you can make it bigger is to ensure that breaking a digital lock for a lawful purpose remains lawful. That's my first law. Anytime someone puts a lock on something that belongs to you and won't give you a key, that lock has not been put there for your benefit. And my second law is fame won't make you rich, but you can't sell your art without it. So there's a great internet thinker, you've probably heard of a guy named Tim O'Reilly, coined the term Web 2.0, popularized the term open source, publishes those books with the animals on the cover. And Tim O'Reilly once quipped, he quips a lot, he quipped, for most artists the problem isn't piracy, it's obscurity. And that quip has gone around the world a million times since. And I think that most people who hear him say that, they think that what he means is once you are famous you will be rich. That is obviously not true. What he's really saying is if no one's ever heard of you they won't buy your stuff. Being well-known is the necessary but insufficient precondition to selling works to people. People who don't know your works exist cannot, by definition, purchase them. Now, in the 21st century, the way that people find out that our works exist is on the internet. We use search engines, we use social media, we use online platforms like YouTube to make our works available and promote them. And the way that we get paid for them, it's also online, Stripe, uh, PayPal, um, uh, other payment processors, ad brokers like Google, crowdfunders like Kickstarter, GoFundMe, Indiegogo. And the internet has spawned many indie successes who have managed to put together all the functions of a publisher or a label or a studio by gathering these pieces and piecing them together into a kind of DIY chimeric homebrew publisher. Um, some of those were artists who started out in the mainstream and then went independent. Uh, think of uh, Trent Reznor, Nine Inch Nails, or Amanda Palmer. Some of them were artists that started off as indies and then made the jump into the mainstream. Hugh Howey in his book Wool, uh, Randall Monroe from XKCD. Some are artists who started indie and never aspired to the mainstream and earn a really tidy living being independents, like Jonathan Colton, who's kind of a nerd troubadour. Now, this is really important even for those of us who never do independent media, who are always within the silos of the big five publishers, the big four studios, big five, or the big four labels, big five studios. Um, because all of these independents, they represent a kind of competitor of last resort in an extremely concentrated sector. So when there's only four record labels, they don't really need to collude to converge on a set of terms that aren't very good for artists and are very good for their shareholders. For one thing, when there's only four record labels, there's enough intermingling, right? When you get fired or move out of one job, chances are you end up working for the competitor across the road and you move back and forth and back and forth. And so the institutional knowledge spreads. This is a thing well understood by competition theorists, that highly concentrated sectors converge not through explicit collusion, but because everyone knows each other. They're married to each other. They're second generations. Dad worked for Warner's, son works for Sony. And so they converge on a set of terms, and those terms are beneficial to the firms and not to the creators. And so when there is less competition among those buyers, we sellers in the supply chain, we get a raw deal. Now, the, the contracts that you get out of the, out of the big studios, the big labels, uh, the big publishers, they reflect that. Um, if you're a musician and you sign a standard record deal, you have a line item in your royalty statement for what's called breakage that's deducted from all of the royalties of all of your sales. Breakage is a statistically approximate number of vinyl record albums expected to be broken between the factory and the high street. And it's deducted from your MP3 royalties. The accounting basis for this is that, right? There's only four of us. If you don't like it, pound sand. Get two tin cans and a string and see how many records you sell. And uh, if you're a writer, you'll find that increasingly all of your rights are taken by your publisher. You don't get to split your Commonwealth and US rights. You don't get to retain your audiobook rights, your graphic novel rights, even your film rights are being snapped up. If you uh, option something to film, you lose your stage rights. Because when there aren't many competitors, the deal gets worse for us. But the indie channel, as I said before, that's our competitor of last resort. The worst deal they can offer us has to be better than the best deal we know we can get for ourselves, or at least that we rationally expect 
we can get for ourselves out there in the indie channel. So it follows that the more competitive that indie channel is, the better the deal we get, even if we never use that channel. But the indie, but the, um, indie channel and the intermediaries that make it up are being clobbered by big content. Uh, intermediary liability has become a feature of all copyright law, ratcheting up the amount of compliance expenditure and thus the difficulty of starting and operating a, competi a competing business in that sector. It's been a feature of TPP and the IP chapter, a feature of ACTA, a feature of ongoing no negotiations at WIPO and so on. Everybody wants Google, wants PayPal, wants DNS providers and so on to police the internet on behalf of copyright proprietors. And while um, those are all things that Google and the rest of them may be able to do, no one will ever propose a regulation for Google that Google can't comply with. Google of 10 years ago may not have had the capital to build a $300 million content ID system. And so what that means is that effectively Google gets to be the last company that serves as the kind of intermediary they are. We see that playing out too. When Google launched its streaming music service, it gathered the big four labels in a room, negotiated with them as equals came up with a deal for streaming licenses and went to the independent sector and said, you will take the deal that the big four has negotiated or you are barred from using YouTube to promote your music forever. And so everybody got the same deal. It's like looking, you know, people who talk about big content and big tech, they've missed the last chapter of Animal Farm when you look from the pigs to the farmers and you can't tell the difference. If you're a creator and you want to claim the lion's share of the income, you can't rely on either of them having your best interests at heart. They will always have their shareholders' best interests at heart. And anything we do that reduces competitiveness in either of those sectors makes it easier for them to collude and harder for us to get a good deal. So when we reduce the diversity in that services to author sector that it, all those intermediaries represent, we reduce the money that creators get in their pockets. So fame won't make you rich, but no one will buy your work unless they've heard of it, and the way that they hear about it is online. So my third law, the most important law, is information doesn't want to be free. You may have heard people talking about information wanting to be free. Um, I really wanted to get to the bottom of this, so I invited information to the Sierras for a camping weekend. We drank Oki Chardonnay, we had a sweat lodge, we cried about our parents. At the end, information took me in a long, manly hug. I felt its beard rasp against my cheek. I smelled the wood smoke in its hair, and it whispered its secret in my ear that it does not want to be free. All information wants from us is for us to stop anthropomorphizing it. Because <laughs> information doesn't want anything, and if it did, who cares? And I haven't spent the last 15, 20 years of my life doing this because I care about what information wants. But I do care about what people want. And people want to be free. And when you live in an information age, the way you make people free is by having free, fair, and open information infrastructure. Now, it's an accident of history that the thing that we use to test whether or not copyright law applies to you is the thing the internet does all day long. Copyright started off as an industrial regulation for the entertainment industry. And the way we figured out whether you were in the entertainment industry is whether you were making or handling copies. Every book had a printing press in its uh, provenance after all. Films always had film labs. And so it was a good bet that you were part of the industry when you were making or handling copies. But the internet works by making and handling copies. And you make 100 copies before breakfast. And it does not make you part of the entertainment industry any more than buying lunch for a friend makes you part of the finance industry because some money has changed hands. I'm all for having good rules for the entertainment industry. I'm in that industry. I need a good, clear framework. But the idea that everything we do on the internet should be regulated by copyright is a nonsense. Even the idea that everything that people do with our works should be regulated by copyright is a nonsense. It's never been the case that reading a book required you to understand copyright law. Nor will most people ever understand copyright law who read books. And to assert otherwise is King Canuti at its worst. We will never have a realm in which 12-year-olds writing Harry Potter fanfic understand copyright law and wield it as skillfully as Universal Studios does when they license Harry Potter from Warner Brothers to make the Harry Potter ride. Anything that makes it fit for her purposes will make it unsuited for theirs. And even if she were the Doogie Hauser progeny of 12-year-old lawyers and she rang up Warner Brothers, who are down the road from me in Burbank, California, they would hang up on her because they are not in the business of granting fanfic licenses to 12-year-olds. 
But 12-year-olds have written fanfic for as long as people have written. My first experience as a writer was coming back from Star Wars in 1977 on The Family Dinosaur, gathering some paper, stapling it together in a booklet, and writing out the story over and over again like a kid practicing scales on the piano. If I were six years old today, I'd be doing that and posting it to some platform where I hang out with my friends. It does not make me part of the entertainment industry supply chain, and it is a nonsense to apply the highly technical very difficult to parse rules of the entertainment industry to people who are engaged in normal activities related to entertainment content, but even worse for people who are not even engaged in the entertainment industry in any way. Uh, we cannot regulate the internet as though the most important thing about it is the 00001% of us who are living in the creative arts. Um, the internet is not a glorified video on demand service, nor is it the world's most perfect pornography distribution system, nor is it the greatest tool for recruiting jihadis that we've ever seen. The internet is the nervous system of the 21st century. And so it does all of those things and everything else besides, because everything we do today involves the internet, and everything we do tomorrow is going to require the internet. So while it's true that DRM is a bad deal for creators, publishers, and audiences, that's the sideshow. The real cost of DRM is that in order to make it viable, you have to make it illegal to disclose the defects in it. Because once you know where the keys are hidden, you can break it. And so any system that has DRM in it becomes off limits to security research under uh, implementations of the WIPO Copyright Treaty and under the US free trade agreements with various partner nations around the world and under the thankfully maybe permanently defunct IP chapters of TPP. And what that means is that anyone who tells you about a defect in your phone or your computer or your thermostat or your automobile or the apps that control your hearing aid or your pacemaker can go to jail for doing so. And it means that the devices that we rely on as a matter of life and death are being turned into these long-lived reservoirs of digital pathogens ripe to be exploited by creeps and voyeurs, identity thieves, spies, cops, and governments because the world is made of computers. Your car is a computer that whisks you down the road at 60 miles an hour. In summer 2014, Jeep Chrysler had to recall 1.4 million of those cars because it turned out that these cars that had a Wi-Fi hotspot in them that you could activate with a credit card to keep the kids entertained on long drives could be remotely driven over the internet. And the researchers who revealed it risked criminal and civil liability for telling 1.4 million people that they were at risk of anyone anywhere online taking over their cars and driving them off the road. Um, in 2015, the John Deere company went further than Chrysler did. They said that anyone who reveals how their tractors work faces criminal and civil liability and asked the US Copyright Office to affirm that. They said that farmers shouldn't be able to extract the data from their tractors about the uh, soil conditions in their field, data generated by the uh, torque sensors on the wheels and the humidity sensors and the undercarriage, because in order to do so, they had to break the DRM, and breaking the DRM should be illegal because you don't really own your tractor, you only license it since it's an inert hunk of metal without the software, and they've never transferred title to the software to you. It's tenant farming by another name. You don't, you're not a tenant of your land anymore. You're a tenant of the agricultural equipment with which you work that land. And it's not just that vehicles are computers we put our bodies into. Buildings are computers we put our bodies into. Tall buildings and seismically active places, they have seismic dampers. Huge masses of concrete or water controlled to brace the building against seismic stresses. Uh, mess with the computer that controls that, the building falls down. Skyscrapers are case mods we put bankers into. Uh, as we discovered during the ransomware epidemic of 2016, hospitals are computers we put sick people into. Take the, take the computers out. The hospital is just a place where you go to die. Pacemakers are computers we put in our body. Baby monitors are computers that have cameras that witness us at our most intimate moments and are connected to the internet. Voting machines are computers we put democracies into. And we suck at securing computers. And in order to get better at it, we have to satisfy three minimum requirements, all of which are at odds with the copyright framework that we have converged on by, being, uh, by thinking about the internet as an entertainment platform instead of a digital nervous system. The first principle is that it should always be legal to investigate computers. 
Security, uh, there's no, there should be no civil or criminal impediments to the basic, noble, and ancient task of studying the world and learning how it works. And states should not create moral hazards by, uh, by creating business models that collapse if people are allowed to know how the systems that they rely on work. The second one is that it should always be legal to disclose true facts about computers and, the, and their defects under every circumstance. Security research is not a job title, it's an activity. You are a security researcher if you know a fact that is true about security. No one should be the arbiter of who gets to tell the truth or under what circumstances, least of all, the companies whose products have been found to be defective and whose interests are threatened should the truth come out. They are uniquely unsuited to being the custodians of bad news that we need to know and that negatively affects them. And finally, it must always be legal to reconfigure our computers in accordance with our needs. We've learned over and over again that giving companies monopolies over the tactics to remediate their blunders is not sufficient to remediate them. If your life or your fortune or your privacy or your family is on the line, the company that sold you a product should never have a veto over the way you alter or combine or cabin off their product so that you can safely use it. Giving firms monopolies over sales, service, bug reports, configurations, apps, and aftermarkets is great news for those companies, but it's terrible public policy. The world has only enacted these laws because the US Trade Representative arm twisted them into it, as you well know from the TPP adventure. But at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, for whom I work, we're suing the US government to overturn this law. There's no way it passes constitutional muster. And sooner or later, we are going to win. And when we do, American firms will be allowed to make products that add new features, that uh, add new uh, consumables, that uh, um, add new parts to existing products. But New Zealand won't be because you will have signed an agreement with the Americans that this, their Supreme Court is destined to overturn in their end. Stacking the deck against the disclosures of flaws and devices that we rely on for everything is a terrible idea. You should be allowed to know about the flaws in your iPhone, a device that has a camera, a mic, a location sensor, and who knows who all your friends are and what you talk about with them, even if doing so makes it harder for Apple to maximize its revenue from apps and service. And when it comes to increasing liability for all those intermediaries, the major effect has nothing to do with re reducing competition for the artists. After all, there's 300 hours of video landing in YouTube's ingester every minute. They're not amateur movies or pirate TV. They're the personal communications, the dialogue, the dissident footage from war zones, the raw stuff of communications. And that goes for Facebook and tweets and everything else. And this is where someone says, well, it's just useless cat pictures for the most part, isn't it? And you know the response is supposed to be, well, there's a lot of cat pictures in there, but somewhere in that dross is something very important to a democracy somewhere. But I'm going to speak for the cat pictures for a minute. Because to condemn cat pictures, to condemn the mundane, is the height of arrogance. When my wife comes down to the kitchen for breakfast in the morning, I always ask how she slept. And I don't do so because I'm unaware of how she slept. When my wife has a bad night, she sleeps next to me. I know exactly how badly she slept. But it's a coded message in the world's easiest to decode cipher. It's just saying, I love you. You matter to me. I'm thinking of you. And it is that, that substrate of seemingly meaningless and mundane communications that forms the soil in which every meaningful connection we have is nurtured. Right? When someone says, I lost the job, I got the job, I have cancer, I beat cancer, the only reason it matters is because of all of those tiny moments. And to dismiss the personal is banal misses the point. The reason other people's social media messages mean nothing to you is because they're not destined for you. Now, we've set up a system where any file can be removed from the internet just by pointing at it and alleging that it infringes copyright without evidence and without meaningful penalties for abuse. And notice and takedown has become a moral hazard. Homegrown Nazis in the UK or um, the King of Thailand and many other people who would prefer that things embarrassing about them not be in the public domain routinely abuse copyright with impunity to make those things disappear off the internet. And this has only gotten worse as the evidence of how bad it is has mounted. Now we have notice and stay down systems that allow unaccountable unaccount parties to bulk register words and sounds and images and to lay claim to them as copyright works without evidence and without penalty for 
sloppiness or falsehood, such that no one else can upload files that contain uh, anything that appears to match those words or images or sounds, uh, without reference to fair dealing, without any kind of reference to de minimis exemptions, and without reference to the frequent incidences of outright copy fraud in which people claim to own things that they have no legitimate claim over. If you set up a system like this for censorship without due process, you would be criminally foolish if you fail to anticipate that it would be abused. And the same goes for those web blocking orders that have become a feature of so many copyright systems. That is an idea that the world recoiled from in horror when it was invented by the Ayatollah and the Chinese Politburo, but it has now found an improbable currency because we're sure that the right governments will never use it in the wrong way. Now, you lived through this firsthand, back through the 92A uh, debacle, which made you the living laboratory for big content's big idea, that the punishment for being accused of watching television the wrong way is that you and everyone you live with should be connect disconnected from a single wire that delivers free speech, a free press, access to tools and ideas, education, social mobility, the, civil sp the civic sphere. That idea was so grotesque and manifestly unfair that it was stricken from your law books only to be reintroduced as a rider to the Christchurch Relief uh, Bill, which is a, a moment that should live in infamy in your collective consciousness. The fact that that MP qu quickly retired from public life afterwards should not uh, uh, absolve them of their responsibility for thinking of nothing more than a distant entertainment industry when their countrymen were lying under the rubble. Now, I earn my living in the entertainment industry. I live around the corner from Warner and Disney and Universal, and I happen to believe that I can earn a living without spying on everyone, without being granted censorship authority over the net. But even if I wasn't, I would still fight for the free, fair, and open internet. Now, I've dreamt all my life of living as a writer. It is a dream come true to wake up every morning and realize that people pay me to entertain you in the long slog from the cradle to the grave with made up stories. And ensuring that artists who succeed get paid, that's a noble goal. But more than that, artists should never be on the side of censorship. Artists should always be on the side of free expression. Try anything and everything to get your quarter, your coin to land on edge. But if you plan on breaking the internet to accomplish it, you are on the wrong side of history. Thank you. Do we have, uh, I, I've lost track of the time. Do we have time for questions? Yes. All right. I remind you that a long rambling statement by, uh, followed by what do you think of that is a technical question, but not a good one. No? Yes? Oh, there we go. That sounds right. like it's turned Very on. Good. Okay. Just to repeat what Corey said, a question, good rule of thumb that they taught us at journalism school. Where, what, why? Hang on. Where, what, why, who? How? If it has that in it, you're probably going well. Mm. Where am I? Okay. A single sentence that goes up at the end. That's a good rule of thumb. Awesome. <laughs> here, here. here chuck, the, chuck the mic over. Let me put down my pen so I can. There we go. That's great. Uh, um, Corey, um, you didn't talk about sort of like the length of copyright after the death of creator mm -hmm. or the things that corporate life, you know, does mm -hmm. to those sorts of things. What are your views on Sure. Um, so I think that inarguably uh, very long terms of copyright are, uh, have no economic basis. I, you know, the economists who study it, they, they're, they're pretty clear that if you want to maximize the revenue to artists um, and, and maximize the incentive to create, a few decades is plenty. But I, I recently did a, a, a conference about this in, in Melbourne with um, an academic from Monash who, uh, Rebecca Giblin, who pointed out that there's another dimension here, that on the one hand, there's the kind of economically rational case for ensuring that um, we incentivize as much creation. And there, a shorter term, you know, the economists say 14 years, 20 years is perfectly fine. But then there's this kind of moral case where we want to make sure that the people that we love are well compensated. The people who make the works we love are well compensated. Now, under the Berne Convention, Australia, New Zealand, and other, other countries that have signed up, you can't plump for less than author's life plus 50 years. But you could certainly do something like uh, was proposed in the US with the Eldred Act, where you say, it's the author's life in 50 years. 
But if you register the work, so we know who to license it from, we get, um, you get some kind of statutory uh, benefit. You can claim extra damages because uh, people wouldn't have had an excuse to not know where to find the work. And then you can also say, if you want to extend it beyond life in 50 years, you have to, you have to pay to re-register it. So we know at least someone is interested in it. So it's not that it just... Um, it's not that it just rolls on with no one interested in it or its posterity. You know, the abolition of formalities, the registration for in order to get a copyright, um, was problematic in many ways, not, not just because it created this huge pool of works that had historically been in the public domain, but now were locked up and, and un, unavailable for uh, creative reuse, but, but also because it made it hard to ascertain who you needed to talk to in order to take a license. Um, and that's kind of the worst of all worlds, right? To have works that are locked up so no one can use them in order to make sure that artists could get, to get paid, but not knowing which artist to pay in order to use the work really does no one any good. So that's not a terrible framework. It's certainly one that fits within Bern and the WIPO Copyright Treaty and all the, the FTAs as well. Um, and it's one that I think few artists could argue with. Another thing that's important, though, is to think about an expansive set of limitations and exceptions. Uh, I think that setting a floor on what is copyrightable is a very useful uh, element. One of the things that we've seen in, in around the world, particularly in the US, is that a certain kind of hip hop music has become all but extinct, except as a form of illegal music. So the two most successful hip hop albums of all time are Paul's Boutique by the Beastie Boys and It Takes a Nation of Millions to Hold Us Back. They both date back before the practice of paying for samples. They, they were considered to be fair use at that time. If they were cleared at the going rate of $500 a sample, which is what the labels currently look for, um, they would both have lost money, These the two most commercially successful albums of all time in the genre. People today who make music that includes samples include one or two samples, never the kind of density we heard then, unless they're making illegal music that they're not allowed to make money from. Well, that doesn't benefit artists, right? Making, making their art criminal doesn't, doesn't benefit artists. So establishing a floor, saying that short samples are, are de minimis, they're below the threshold that the law considers itself with, that's a very useful piece. Establishing some clearly enumerated fair dealings, as I believe New Zealand has, most Commonwealth countries do, that's useful. But, but adding to them a set of fair use principles like the Australians are considering, so that you don't have to convince a plurality of the legislature to understand and embrace some highly technical question. And rather, you can do it in the way that, that is the least worst, which is having the parties go before a judge and have the judge consider against some policy framework whether or not some new technical use falls in or out of the fair dealing framework gives you on the one hand the bedrock of certainty about the ones that have been decided already and on the other hand some room for entrepreneurial risk taking uh, with new uses that are just emerging. Um, ultimately, we are bound by long terms because of international policy frameworks and I think that um, at the very least, if we were to go back to a blank slate, I would like to see a radically shortened term with, with uh, uh, registration and with a renewal. Uh, not least because renewals give authors enormous power over investors. When you rock up to your first publisher with a book, your publisher is gonna offer you, in almost every case, between six and $7,000 if they're one of the New York publishers because there's a lot more first books looking for a home than there are homes for those first books. But if 14 years later that book is doing remarkably well commercially, and you can say to your publisher, I will not file the renewal paperwork unless we reopen the deal, then your publisher will give you more money for that book. Um, we've seen that play out because there's a mandatory reversion in the US after 35 years, and this is how musicians have gotten decent money for their digital music rights, is by threatening to revert their rights. Yes, uh, Michael Sutton, Corey. Um, what's your opinion on artificial intelligence in terms of the ability for it to then, you've got Amazon, Google, with all of these huge resources with AI engines, and in terms of producing original content and mm -hmm. having AI bots being able to, under the Asia of their owner, being able to register those for copyright and theoretically extinguish you know, human yeah. So I think that AI is currently, um, you know, if you think about the Gartner hype cycle, it's it's nearing a peak. The the actual accomplishments of AI thus far are are um, a mixed bag, and they've gained a lot of ground, 
But you know, there's two kinds of curves that AI could be riding. The first one is the most common one we see, which is the S curve, which is you're, you're pottering along, not making much progress. You make a little breakthrough, you go up like that, then you exhaust the breakthrough and you potter along without much progress. The other one it could be doing is that hockey stick curve, where it just goes, screams upward to infinity forever. When you're in this part of the curve, there's no way to know whether you're in an S curve or in, or in the, the asymptotic curve. And so maybe AI will continue to make breakthroughs. If it does, I'm inclined to think that how we apportion creative uh, revenue will be a fairly small potatoes question relative to like all of the other questions that will be raised by it, right? Because that really would be remarkable. Um, but I, I do think that it's a very fraught business to talk about a, a creator and a tool as being ineligible for uh, to be recognized as doing something expressive. So copyrights often, a, a copyrightability is often a proxy for whether something expressive has been uttered or created. Um, and expressive speech in most states is entitled to a degree of protection that technical or non-expressive speech is not entitled to. And what my concern is that there is enormous expressive potential and how people tune and operate machine learning systems. And that if we were to have a, a bright line rule that says if you're doing any kind of recombinant unsupervised machine learning, you are not eligible for a copyright, that it would invite states to say you are also not entitled to speech protection. And we saw a little version of this play out because in the early days, Google claimed that its, its ranking algorithm was maths. And so people who came and complained and said, you've ranked me too low fix it, why are, you, why are you editorially opposed to me? They said, it's not editorial, it's just the empirical universe of numbers. We have consulted the wall of Plato's cave and found where your site belongs on our, on our site rankings. And then states took notice of this and they said, oh, well we know how to regulate numbers, so please to be sure that all of your search rankings don't mention piracy and don't mention self-harm or gambling or suicide or uh, drugs or, or, or any of the other things that states have an interest in regulating. That's when Google started to pay free speech scholars to write about how there was something deeply editorial and expressive in writing the algorithms that ranked their search rankings. Um, which is also to say that the companies making machine learning systems aren't always the best resource to go to when you ask them whether or not copyright should or shouldn't inhere in their works, or whether or not their works are creative. Because they uh, have an instrumental view that relates to their current business fortunes and the reality that they live in. This is why in many common law systems we have the idea of, of, of uh, amici who um, file as friends of the court to ask the court to consider issues that are outside of the, the disputants realm, but in which this might redound. And whenever we're talking about something as broadly applicable as, as machine learning, maths, and algorithm design, there really is uh, a lot of potential collateral damage. Can we ask a question up here since we haven't heard from any uh, female identified people and only male identified people? Thank you. Okay, so you've described a lot of problems of the captured marketing culture. So if you were to take the knowledge we have now, mm -hmm. to redesign a regulatory regime, what would it look like? Oh dear. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I am, I think that's a, that's a really interesting exercise, and there are people who've kind of attempted it. We, we wrote a thing called the Adelphi Charter in the UK about a decade ago that, that took a crack at it. Um, Tim Wu, who's a wonderful copyright scholar, he once proposed that copyright, uh, that copyright should make a, a bright line exemption for anything that adds value. So if you make a thing more valuable, then it should be lawful to do. That's a kind of straight up public interest argument that we as a, we as a polity, uh, the reason we grant monopolies over expressivity to people is because they're creating value that we all are the ultimate beneficiaries of. And so but like sort of by definition, if you add value, then that should be, that should be within that framework. It, all of those seem like uh, good big ideas. And I sometimes wonder like what kind of devil we would find in their details. Thankfully, we've never had to uh, approach that. And you know, as much as it's a, a fun thought experiment, we don't, we don't get blank slates, right? We, you know, terra nullius is a terrible piece of public policy, right? Like there is always something before that can't be erased. Um, but I, I think that, um, some of the elements of European law, particularly where they try to balance out human rights uh, with um, the creator's monopoly, 
are very important. Uh, there's a playwright whose heirs wouldn't allow his works to be performed by women, and a French court said um, that was uh, that didn't pass human rights muster, even though technically you have the right to authorize or withhold authorization. Withholding authorization for reasons that are inconsistent with their human rights framework was uh, was considered a, a bridge too far. Um, so that that I think is probably a nice piece to carve out as well. If I could redesign things from scratch, the one thing I'm sure I would do, as I said in my talk, is try and distinguish the rights we give creators in respect of their investors and distributors with the way that we regulate the relationship of creators to their audiences. I just don't think it's fit for purpose. And I think one of the, one of the things that's led us so far astray in the decades since the internet came along, since it became possible for a human as opposed to a corporation to violate copyright, is that a lot of people my age and older were raised by our forebears, by you know, our foremothers and forefathers to understand in a kind of class war framework that copyright is the one thing that gives the laboring classes uh, leverage over the capital classes. That every, bit, every quantum of copyright you surrender is a loss of leverage over the people who ultimately would exploit your works. I actually think that's pretty true. Um, but I think that um, it has nothing to do with our relationships with our audiences. That, that you know, sh rattling your saber at your audiences does you no good. And, and given that copying is only going to get easier from now on, right? Your, your grandkids will sit around the Christmas table in 30 years and say, tell me again, grandma, tell me again, grandpa, about 2018, when we couldn't buy six thumb drives for a dollar at the chemist that could hold all of the works ever made, right? When every pensioner hadn't been retrained in a public library to type movie name space BitTorrent, you know? Um, <laughs> that you know that we are always ultimately going to have this this thing where our audiences can choose not to pay for our works i mean that's always been the case because we've had libraries and other things but but that choice is only going to get easier and so we're going to have to use moral suasion to to convince them to be in the tent pissing out rather than out of the tent pissing in and threats run counter to that right convincing your your audience that they should compensate you because you're the kind of person who deserves compensation is incompatible with saying, I want to take your house away and put your kids in penury because you watch telly the wrong way. Uh, you can't really have it both ways. I don't know if that answers your question. It's a bit rambly, I, I admit. There, there is no perfect answer to a question like that. Yeah, that's true. How would you fix the world if you could fix the world? Yeah. Down the back. How far can I have this thing? Well done. Uh, kia ora tato, uh, Corey. Um, unlike the trash fire that you've so eloquently pointed out uh, that is New Zealand's copyright law, our patent act is in a little bit better shape. Uh -huh. So we, we actually managed to include a research exclusion in our last review, and we also exclusively removed uh, software from it, although we have an allowance for things that are implemented in hardware, which is a silly but that's, that was Fisher and Peitel doing, doing their job. So how do you see that interplaying with the, the, the TPPA provisions, the WIPO provisions, and that we do in New Zealand actually have some outs for doing basically key cracking and, and, and locks, digital locks through the Patent Act? So I don't think that, that it matters. I think that when you, have a, when you have a prohibition on circumvention, the fact that you have an authorization to circumvent in one domain probably doesn't affect the prohibition on circumvention in another domain, right? That you know, it just means that a patent can't be invoked to punish you for circumventing. But you know, the WTO court stands ready to punish you if you authorize circumvention uh, in other ways. Now, um, you know, the, the, all of those frameworks they contain carve outs for uh, legitimate activity. You know, the, the, you don't have to implement them in a way that blocks people from um, circumventing for lawful purposes. And really, if you want to avoid the doubt, just make it possible to s circumvent for a lawful purpose, and you get around a lot of it. You know, the, it, maybe it's worth talking about our, our, our 
uh, pending litigation here over, over Section 1201 of the DMCA, which is the U.S. anti-circumvention law, and the two legal theories we've brought. So we're representing two clients. One of them is a Johns Hopkins researcher named uh, Matthew Green. He has a National Science Foundation grant and a publishing contract to investigate defects in DRM systems, including uh, hospital and medical systems, voting machines, high-speed payment uh, processing, black boxes, and payment centers. And the other one is a hardware researcher uh, from MIT, Bunny Huang, Andrew Bunny Huang, who um, builds a device that allows you to inject stills into HDCP signals like this one. So bars use it to like say announce you know half price chicken wings for the next 30 minutes. And he wants to make a, a PVR that goes with it so you can record high definition signals to make fair uses. And uh, we have brought the case on both of their behalf uh, after looking at some Supreme Court decisions that didn't go the way that we'd hoped but that did cause the Supremes to clarify what the US view is of copyright and its relationship to free expression. Because in the US, you have this First Amendment to the Constitution that, pro that prohibits uh, the state making incursions into expression. But then you also have copyright law that's a state-granted monopoly over who can utter some words or songs or, or what have you. It's a hard thing to square. And so the Supremes took two runs at it, one in a case called Golan and the other in a case called Eldred. And in Golan, what they said is that um, Copyright is only constitutional, only squared with the First Amendment when it hews to what they call the traditional contours, maps and games and uh, songs and books and so on. But adding a copyrighted work to a functional work does not make the whole thing a copyrighted work. A toaster with software in it is not a copyrighted toaster. Uh, uh, a um, a, a t-shirt with a two-dimensional piece of art in it, the art is protected, but the t-shirt is not, because the design is not a, co it's a functional design, not entitled to copyright. And so the vogue for including like a one molecule thick layer of DRM in anything that has firmware, in order to assert that using it in ways that frustrates the shareholders of the company that made it is unlawful, that vogue would be ended by, by a finding that showed that the traditional contours of copyright uh, uh, exclude those from being covered under the statute. And then the other one is, uh, in, in Bunny's case, um, in Eldred, the Supreme said that the thing that allows copyright to square with the First Amendment is fair use. That fair use is the free expression escape valve that allows the two to, to sit side by side, and that therefore any copyright law that doesn't take account of fair use is not constitutional. And so since Section 1201 doesn't authorize circumvention for the purpose of making a fair use, it's unconstitutional. So I'm relatively confident. I mean, it's going to take years, but I'm relatively confident we are going to win. We have good facts. We have good clients. Um, the only question that we're, that we're waiting to hear on now is standing under the US system. If you face criminal liability, even before someone has threatened you, you can ask a court to adjudicate whether or not that liability passes constitutional muster. And so we have been waiting for a ruling on standing for over a year now, and the judge can only wait so long. We, we think that we'll get um, a ruling soon, and, and I think we'll get a ruling in our favor. Um, clearly, both of these people have bona fide intents to make these uses, right? They have grants, they have book publishing contracts, they have existing product lines with customers, they have business plans. And so they have the right to know whether or not this law binds them or not. Um, and I just don't see how you can square it with, with uh, these Supreme Court decisions. And I really do think that all these countries that have been arm twisted by the US into insisting that their own industries not pursue these, these profitable lines of work, they're gonna be the only ones that can't do it. And the US is gonna be merrily exporting products to them uh, and, and you're going to be stuck paying over the odds for stuff that the at U.S. insistence and the U.S. is going to back out of its agreement. Thanks. We probably have time for two more questions. Well, we have another question from a woman up here. Up here? Yeah, there, I think. No, do you have your hand up? Oh, no, you've got your hand on your head. Sorry. Do you have a question here? Right. No. All, right. All right. Do we have any other women who want to ask a question? Fine, I'll save the floor to a man. <laughs> Doesn't happen very often. Oh, Brenda, you go. Where did you get your shoes? They're awesome. Oh. <laughs> They're from the uh, Atheist Shoe Company of Berlin, Germany. They, they say, Ich bin Atheist on the soles. Bit of, uh, bit of subtle, you leave, you leave great tracks in the sand. This is terrifying. Kia ora, Corey. that was inspiring and remarkable. So I'm curious, while we wait for you to win, 
how can we support the folk who are hacking those Don John Deere tractors, who mm -hmm. are fixing Apple products and some in the US, who are using SciHub to get the publications they need, who are making their own insulin? I know that's a giant question, but just yeah. Curious. Well, I mean, advocacy groups like Internet NZ are a really important piece of the puzzle. Uh, I know that Internet NZ and its members, Daniel and so on, you did really excellent work on TPP. It's really important that this that this be a multilateral issue. I mean, I think we in the U.S. have an especial duty only because we're kind of the we're like the Mordor of of bad copyright policy. Like everything emanates from us, but. Um, Nevertheless, everybody needs to be a part of the solution, not least because we all have something at stake. I'd be remiss if I failed to point out that EFF is an international organization that welcomes your membership, and we do work all over the world, uh, including in multi-stakeholder uh, intergovernmental bodies and at WIPO, uh, at the EU, and so on. And so you could do worse than to join and support EFF. If you're a coder, EFF has a, um, a bunch of open GitHub projects with pulls uh, uh, that you can, bu open bugs that you can work on, um, Privacy Badger, uh, CertBot. We have encrypted the web, right? We've given out 100 million certificates with Let's Encrypt in the last year. Uh, and we have moved the needle in a meaningful way on how much of the web is encrypted. And we are going to get to 100% pretty dang soon at the rate we're going. And so CertBot is an, an important piece of that. If you're a hacker, come hack on that with us. Um, we have uh, HTTPS Everywhere and other pieces that, that work in tandem with that. Um, in terms of New Zealand and its place in the world, you know, the world is waiting for someone to defect on these, uh, on, on this DRM stuff. You know, Israel is right now the only industrialized nation in the world that doesn't have a, a, a ban on circumvention. Um, there is wiggle room for you guys to permit circumvention for lawful purposes. And that includes making third-party printer cartridge chips and all kinds of other things that there's a very lucrative market for. You know, if a uh, car manufacturer is charging tens of thousands of dollars for diagnostic tools who have a cost of materials of 100 bucks. And the reason they can charge that much is because you have to remove DRM to get at the diagnostic codes from the cars. It's not hard to make that tool. You can export it as pure software. Right and collect hundred-dollar PayPal sums that uh, you know, and people install it on their laptops and plug it into their cars. Every independent mechanic in the world needs that code, and you could supply it. Um, same with with tractor firmware. Right now, tractor firmware is being maintained either by John Deere or there are anonymous Ukrainian farmers who've written their own firmware. And farmers all over the world, I'm sure in New Zealand too, are downloading their own John Deere firmware and installing it. We know nothing about who made it. Like the potential food security implications of that are actually pretty scary. Having a named firm that can make a warranty and whose code is inspected and, and liable to inspection and so on, that, that would be an enormous advance. And again, there's a lot of money to be made from this. Um, so it becomes a source of major exports, certainly more than the odd movie. Right? I mean, you know, they're nice movies and all. I like them. But, you know, the, the most, most, most places don't, have, don't become Hollywood forever. I mean, you know, Hollywood is wondering whether it's going to be Hollywood forever. Uh, with all due respect, you're a long way off from there. Uh, and um, it's a lot more of a lottery ticket to count on, on um, long-term revenue from hobbits than it is long-term revenue from open firmware. Uh, and so I, I do think that like the first country to break uh, from this consensus will enjoy an enormous uh, head start and a possibly permanent trade advantage or at least long-term trade advantage with the rest of the world. Everybody wants it, right? Nobody wants DRM. Like no one woke up this morning and said, I wish my printer ink cost more, right? <laughs> so it, there's, your, there's your opportunity. Let your finish drinking. Um, kia ora, Corey. Um, I think I heard you say that going to court is the least worst outcome. Mm -hmm. um, and just to draw that together, you also mentioned obviously fair use being a product of your constitution. Mm -hmm. So in New Zealand, we're a pretty small country. And if we adopt uh, fair use, a lot of people, as they said in Australia, would say, that's only of benefit to lawyers. What do you say to that? Well, it's not like non-lawyers make changes in the legislature, right? It's not like you have two systems. One is that you sue 
or defend a claim about a copyright use, uh, and you hire a lawyer to do it. And the other one is that you just ring up your MP and have them pass a bill, right? The, the, both models start with hire a lawyer. The difference is that the, the fair dealing model for changing the limitations and exceptions starts with hire a lawyer and then lobby a plurality of your MPs into enacting legislation. That's hard crack. I mean, it's not easy to do that. And it is much easier, especially if you have public interest law firms, which is a thing you can fund or create and, and so on. It's much easier. And the funding associated with it is much more bounded, right? As you saw with the 92A, you can spend, like there's not really any limit to how much money can be spent on a legislative battle. But adding more lawyers, it's like, it's like the mythical man month, right? Adding more lawyers to a, a lawsuit does not improve your chances above a certain point. So there comes a, there's, there's a kind of upper limit on how much you can spend on litigation over whether or not a use is fair relative to how much money you can spend on a legislative fight. Like I was there in the EU when we were fighting over the privacy directive. Uh, and there's just like, there's no, like there were something like three lawyers for every MPP considering the, the uh, privacy directive in Brussels. All of them drawing, you know, six hundred dollars an hour to to wine and dine and entertain and argue with these MPPs and their staffers. Like that is a much bigger investment to make a change in the law or to resist a change in the law. And we we lost in the EU on the privacy directive. It looks good on its face, but it, it has this carve out that says if you anonymize data, you no longer have a duty to to treat it as though it's potentially harmful. There's no definition of what anonymized means. And no computer scientists, except for companies that sell anonymization products, particularly believe that you can anonymize large data sets. And so you know, we completely lost, because they put this huge loophole in it. Whereas if it were just litigation, and, and as we've seen with litigation over privacy practices, you can actually win victories, important victories. Look at Max Schrem and the, the Facebook victory. And so again, it's like it is the least worst. Right, uh, you know, ideally, evidence-based policy would be easy because we could look at the world, arrive at an empirical conclusion that w had broad consensus, and it would be enacted in law. In practice, first of all, sometimes reality is messier, and policy questions involve weighing uh, different interests in the balance and not answering empirical questions. Although maybe the balance can be empirical, or the the, the things on either side of the balance might be empirical, but the but the relative weight is not empirical. And that's a, that's a really hard process to get through. I mean, 92A, right? You, you actually managed to get rid of it, and then it got snuck in under cover of darkness. And, and that guy did not retire in shame, right? He's, he's, he's part of your great and your good. He's got a Wikipedia entry, you know? <laughs> and not one that lists him for being infamous. I'm not sure they're having a Wikipedia right there. The, but but the, the ones that the ones that are about how great you are. Yeah, okay. There's probably time for one more quickly. Does anyone have one last question? All right. I keep skipping. Very quickly, thank you very much. Uh, fascinating talk. Um, your message is there's lots of hope and, and um, good change that, that you're, you're describing. Um, I'm a bit stuck on DRM going into HTML5. Like, what happens next? Oh, oh, <laughs> God. You know, if my wife were here, she'd be like, don't ask him about DRM and HTML5. Um, so for those of you who don't know, the W3C is an organization that historically has been at the forefront of open standards for the web. It was founded by Tim Berners-Lee, the creator of the web. And it has historically refused to allow anything that would create lock-in or impede the ability of people to make uh, competing web browsers. And um, as apps grew, and as the sector concentrated, it saw its own fortunes sinking. In part, that was due to some uh, not great decisions they made themselves, where they pursued this thing called the semantic web that turned out to be kind of a non-starter. And so people who wanted to just get on with making the web started to do their work outside of its uh, rooms. And then it, it saw its relevance dwindling. And um, Netflix made them an offer they couldn't refuse. They said, we're going to boycott the web and only distribute by apps. And everyone will follow us unless you put DRM in browsers. And the thing is that they were just about to get rid of any possibility of having DRM in browsers, because the way browsers have historically hooked up to DRM is with these APIs that went really deep into the operating system. And the problem with that is if a thing that faces the internet 
also connects really deeply into your operating system, then malware that comes in by that path goes straight to the heart of your operating system and does unspeakably bad things. And so they were going to isolate the browser much more from the inner workings of the, of the operating system, which would have made DRM a practical impossibility. And so um, the uh, Netflix did some deals uh, outside of the W3C with Google and announced that they would do a deal with uh, Mozilla and Firefox. They did a deal with Apple and Safari. And then they said, like, look, all the interesting action is happening outside of the outside of the W3C. Wouldn't you rather have us inside the tent pissing out, et cetera, et cetera. And the W3C announced that they would do it. And Tim and I went out at hammer and tongs. Um, and I went in at hammer and tongs with the advocates for DRM at the W3C. And I always said, this is not going to affect piracy or copyright infringement, but it will, it will allow the enforcement of para copyrights. It'll allow uh, firms to decide who can make a PVR that would otherwise be lawful by restricting the keys to the DRM. It'll also stop people who make open source operating systems or browsers from implementing a browser that can play all the content on the web because the, although the API was open, the thing that it hooked up to, the DRM, was always closed. And so we, it couldn't be implemented in, in by, by uh, open source free software projects. Uh, and so, uh, and I also said that it would endanger 3 billion browser users because um, it would give firms the power to decide who could, di who could disclose defects in browsers. And browsers are not entertainment systems primarily. They're like the portal to everything. And HTML5 is meant to replace apps. And so it's meant to be the control surface for cars and thermostats and pacemakers too. So turning that into a, um, uh, an unauditable attack surface that uh, security researchers wouldn't be allowed to look at, but cyber criminals would, just seemed like a really bad idea. And so I proposed a compromise because they swore blind that this was only about copyright infringement. That no one was looking to monopolize the supply chain. No one was looking to prohibit otherwise lawful activity. No one was looking to stop people from making um, uh, security defect reports. And so we proposed this compromise where the members, as a condition of participation, would say, we voluntarily covenant never to invoke anti-circumvention law, except when there's another cause of action, except when there's a copyright infringement or a patent infringement or a trademark infringement or a theft of our trade secrets or tortious interference in our relationship with our customers. So it's except to enforce our legal rights, but never to enforce a right that no legislature has given us. And they absolutely 100% rejected it. Right? All of the major browser vendors, all of the corporate members rejected it. Now, there are lots of non-corporate members who supported it, and in the end, it was the first ever W3 uh, uh, standard to emerge without consensus. Only 58% of the members who voted voted for it. Uh, and so it represents a really ghastly moment in the W3C's history where they have gone from being a consensus organization devoted to keeping the web open to explicitly permitting the publication of a standard whose members have signaled that they would not uh, um, promise not to abuse it to limit security uh, defect disclosures or to enable other activities. I mean, one of the big ones that is potentially fence fenced off here is accessibility. Like, um, I, I get my mail at a, at a private mailbox around the corner from my house so I don't have to give people my home address. And the woman who works behind the counter, a lovely woman named Jennifer, she has photosensitive epilepsy. And the worst seizure of her life was while watching a movie on Netflix. She had five consecutive grand mal seizures and was hospitalized because of strobes in the video. Now, it's every, photo, every person with photosensitive epilepsy has idiosyncratic elements of their, of their um, uh, photosensitivity. It's not hard to train software to recognize the kind of strobing you shouldn't have to do a look ahead, right, to buffer the video and look ahead, and to pause the video or damp the strobe or take some other step. In this, by the same token, you could imagine as machine learning improves captioning that you might have captioning for people who are um, hearing impaired or that you might have, um, uh, you know, at the standard now is nowhere near there, but it seems pretty obvious that that's a, at least a possibility we'd want to preserve space for. Uh, so there are a lot of these elements where it would be very useful for people who uh, have disabilities to be able to implement the software. And again, that was a thing they explicitly rejected. And I'm really gutted by it. And it actually shows you, I think, how much of our problems relate not to the specific problems of technology or um, the specific problems of corporate structures or what have you, but are rather a problem of uh, lax antitrust enforcement. We've lived through a 40-year experiment 
in which the Chicago school's conception of um, antitrust has been the dominant one throughout the world. And the Chicago school says you only regulate when companies conspire to raise prices. And lowering prices, even if it squeezes the supply chain, getting big, commanding the whole horizontal or vertical, that's OK, too. The only thing that, that consumers have an interest in their governments intervening on is when, prices, is when there's collusion to raise prices. And so now we have this enormous market concentration. I mean, we really wouldn't be needing to have this talk about copyright or the future of news or what have you if we still had the diversity we used to have. right? We, you know, News weathered all kinds of technological shocks over 100 years. You had telegraphs and printing presses and telephones and TV and newsreels and what have you. And it, at every turn, they had these deep war chests that they used to figure out how to react to it. And the, the survivors came through with new business models. But just around the time big tech was getting big, um, all of these newsrooms under these new frameworks were being bought out by private equity funds that were slashing their newsrooms, selling off their buildings and renting them back, making them liable to shocks and high rents, selling off their printing presses and leasing them, firing all their unionized staff and hiring them back as contractors, merging their newsrooms, uh, buying most of their material off of wire services, and doing all these other things that made them very weak and ma made them liable to this shock. And so, you know, I, I hold out very little hope for any immediate fix to antitrust, but I do think that we should acknowledge that anything we do that doesn't involve a fix to antitrust at best is tinkering in the margins uh, because the real problems arise from market concentration. And on that delightfully positive note, yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. The delightful thing about coming to conferences like this is I always walk away both incredibly grim about the world that we live in, but slightly hopeful, slightly hopeful about the future.